Good evening, Bar of Hope. As you know, I'm Sheila Boston, the president of the New York City Bar Association, and I'm very excited about our program this evening, entitled A Conversation with Jamie Boston, Retired Army JAG Officer. Hmm, last name Boston. Sounds familiar, right? Okay, I'll come to that in a second. But this program is sponsored today by the Military and Veteran Affairs Committee at the City Bar. And we have with us this evening, none other than the great chair, Chris Amore. So excited to have him here. Thank you. And the two of us will be interviewing my baby brother. Yes, I said it, my baby brother. How did this come along? Well, I will tell you, I have heard so many stories from my brother um, about his travails and his journey as a JAG officer. And I was like, Jamie, actually I told him he needs to write a book, quite frankly, um, but he's had so many interesting things happen, things he's experienced. And I said, you know what? I think it's important for this word to get out. Now, originally we were supposed to have this program during Black History Month, February, and you know, how schedules can be. So we're having it in the next month, but you know, Black History Month, frankly, should be all year long. We can learn all the time. So I'm very excited about having him here. And without further ado, we're going to jump right into it. But first of all, thank you, Jamie. Thank you for being here. Thank you. By the way, his full government name is Lewis James Boston Jr. Um, but my dad is Lewis, so we went with the middle name and they didn't want to call him James, so he's called Jamie. All right. Well, Jamie and I grew up in Maryland. Prince George's County, Maryland, shout out to you. And we went to the Prince George's County Public Schools. Um, we both went to Oxon Hill High School. But from there, Jamie, um, you stayed in Maryland and you went to none other than John Hopkins University. Uh, you were a political science major. And then you went to American University in DC for law school. So I wanna know, tell us about the journey. Why did you decide to go into the JAG Corps? Well, the JAG Corps and the, and the Army, I'll, I'll talk both, I guess. Um, a little short story, and I might be dating myself a little bit. Um, as Sheila said, uh, we're, we're Army brats. So I always knew I was going to go into the military. Uh, our dad is a true and true soldier, uh, retired lieutenant colonel himself. And so that's just something I knew I was going to do. Uh, I also knew I wanted to be a lawyer at some point in time. The marriage came, though, uh, again, back to dating myself. Those of you might remember the movie A Few Good Men, the old Tom Cruise movie. Um, I had gone to a movie with my girlfriend at the time, and I'm sitting there watching this movie, and it dawned on me, I was like, wait a minute, you can be a lawyer and in the military at the same time. And so that did it. So from that point on, I was 11th grade, I believe, maybe in the 10th grade, and my goal was to become a JAG officer. That's what I want to do for my life. And so I owe that to that movie, actually. And so here we are. So by the way, high school, were you in ROTC? I was. I was in Air Force ROTC. Um, I was a wing commander of, at the time, uh, one of the best programs we had in the country. And so that was my path. I knew the military was where I was going. That was, there was no doubt. And you knew you were going to be a lawyer in the military. So do tell, do you just go to military lawyer school or ha what happens? Do you have to do any kind of physical training? There is there's a lot. And, and Chris actually can speak to this a little bit um, uh, himself. But for me, I did ROTC in, in uh, college uh, as a, uh, that was my scholarship that I had. And then once, um, I got done with ROTC, you have a choice of applying for what you call educational delay. And what that allowed you to do, instead of going, if you get into law school, instead of going to the military right away, you can uh, go to law school, do your time, and then when you come out, you start your active duty time. And so that's what I did. So I went in, um, got commissioned right after college as a second lieutenant, went into law school for three years. And when I came out, applied to the JAG Corps, you still have to apply again to make sure you get into it. And I'll accept it and the rest is history. So Chris, I know you weren't expecting this, but I want you to tell our audience a little bit about your career path. Sure. I, um, I, I, I did not go do ROTC in college. I don't, I'm not sure I even knew what ROTC was when I was in college. Um, so I graduated college in 2001, um, and just a few months later was 9-11. And after 9-11, uh, that's when I was motivated to join. It took about a year and a half to go through the officer application process. Um, but I, by September of 2003, I made it to basic training and then went right to officer candidate school. I spent about four years on active duty as a combat engineer officer, um, went, had deployments in Korea and Iraq, much like you, Jamie, which we'll talk about today, um, before getting out and uh, returning to New York for law school. Um, when I graduated law school, I, um, I missed the army, but not enough to go back full time. So I, 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 uh, I also had to make another application again to become a JAG officer. And so 
Um, that, and that's, that's what I am right now in, in the Army Reserve. I'm a, a JAG officer. And um, that's, been, that's been my time in the military. I don't think I'll forget, but just in case, I want to say it right now. Thank you both for your service. Thank and you. you know, I know what that means. And so it's very sincere. So bless you both. Um, okay, I'm going to go back to this basic training thing. Okay, you're going to be a lawyer. So why in the world do you have to do the basic training? What, what's going on here? Right. So when you talk about the, the JAG, so you go to what we call a JAG officer basic course. And so there you learn a lot of people about, I don't remember the statistics, but probably about 50% of those to the JAG Corps are, have not gone through RTC like I did. And so they have to learn the basic soldiering skills, how to march, how to kind of survive. They do have to go to combat. And so they go for training for that. And then after that, they kind of go to the academic portion and they've changed the week. So I'm a little off on exactly what it is now. But after that, then you learn kind of the military law aspect. And so for that, we go to Charlottesville, Virginia, and we're right next to UVA Law School and we get educated on how to go about the practice of military law. Tell us a little bit about the landscape. What are the differences between military law and the civilian legal landscape? Well, you know, I want to kind of demystify it, and it's one of the reasons why I'm involved in some of the programs I am. Yes, there are some differences. There are some protocols. We call things a little different. We wear a uniform. But at the end of the day, the law is the law. And so um, it's not that much different than what you do in practice, what Chris does in practice. You might call it something different. Um, the basics are there. And so kind of once you learn those protocols and some of the slight changes, you know, practicing is practice. So can I just come into a military court and practice? Uh, actually, Technically, you could. If you get qualified, you could. Um, there, and we'll talk about it, I guess, later on. But uh, particularly when you talk about court martials or trials, criminal trials, uh, an attorney can come in and represent a service member um, if they, you know, fill up certain paperwork and get hired by that service member. And they actually could. Hmm. Okay. What was your first military assignment after JAG school? Fort Drum, New York. Hmm. It's a Common misconception in the military that Fort Drum is in Canada. It's actually not in Canada. It's in the, this very great state of New York, home of the uh, Story 10th Mountain Division. What were, some, glory. Yeah. what were some of uh, your duties at Fort Drum? So uh, I started out, uh, the, usually the first thing in the JAG Corps you do is what we call legal assistance, which is usually like a general practitioner's position. And so I did that, but I also had the, uh, I got to say the honor, of running the Tax Assistance Center, which is basically set up on military installations to help service members and their families do their taxes. So I became kind of a pseudo tax expert, uh, particularly dealing with issues that soldiers' families have to deal with. And uh, I thought that's what I was gonna be doing for a while. And is it, it, was it not for a while? Did you get some news while you were at 10th Mountain that you'd be going somewhere else? Uh, just a little bit, I would say. Um, I guess I'll, I'll tell the story of how I think we're leading up to me going overseas. Correct. Um, what happened was I, I was running the tax center. I think I had, I don't know, maybe like 15, 20 soldiers that, that were in the, the center for me. Uh, we had gone to PT. You were asking about the physical fitness uh, to answer your question. You need to be physically fit, fit uh, to be a JAG or a soldier altogether. Um, may not look like it now, but at some point I kind of was. Um, and so, and there's reasons for that, you know, it's really, so you can be ready to go to combat. Um, but back to my story, uh, what happened was I had, had PT that morning and we were doing pull-ups and it was the weirdest thing. I remember being on the pull-up bar and the next thing you know, I'd passed out and the Sergeant Major of our group, next thing I remember was hitting my chest saying, sir, sir, are you okay? And I had no idea what happened. I'm laying on the ground. It took me a second or two to kind of figure out what's going on. And I was like, yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm all right. And so I, I got up, you know, they were telling me to take it easy. And I said, sure. And so, you know, we finished PT for the day. I went back, took a shower, changed my clothes. I went in to go see my, my team. And I just said, you know, I'm not really feeling too well. Um, kind of cover for me. I hope I don't get in trouble now. But I kind of <laughs> left my duty station for a little bit and said, look, cover me for a little bit. I'm not feeling well. I just want to go down, lay down for a little bit. Um, you know, I passed out and then, you know, anything happens, call me. So I left and remember, this is my first assignment. So I really don't know all the ropes like I should at the time. So I go and I pass out at home. And then when I say pass out, I fall asleep. And uh, I wake up, I don't know, maybe two or three hours later. And I look at my phone and there's tons of calls from the, from the head shed, we call it, from the, from the main JAG office. Clearly they were looking for me. So I'm thinking my army career is pretty much over before it even starts. Um, Cause we're only a few months into it. 
And so I pick up the phone, like, sir, they're looking for you. Uh, and so I rush and get into to get in the post. And I'm thinking about what I'm going to tell the colonel who's going to be yelling at me for, you know, leaving my post and, and so forth. And so I, I get in and go upstairs to, to his office and he just has this look on his face. And I'm like, well, okay, you know, this is it. And so I, he's like, sit down. Um, and so I'm thinking he's about to yell at me, but instead he tells me, well, um, I have some information for you and, and I just need you to, to understand what's going. And so he proceeds to tell me that 10th Mountain had received orders to deploy to Iraq. Uh, which was unique about this is at that time, 10th Mountain was known for going to Afghanistan. They had all kinds of tours. Um, in fact, 2nd Brigade, which was what I was a part of at the time, was the most deployed unit in the Army, a brigade in the Army. And so what was unique about this is that it wasn't Afghanistan. We were going to Iraq. So new territory for us. And I just sat there just kind of stunned. I mean, one, I was relieved because I wasn't getting kicked out of the military. But then I'm also adjusting to, wow, it's really happening. I'm deploying. And it goes from there. So how did you how did you take the news? I mean, was was going overseas part of your hopes when you or, or in, in the realm of possibility for you when you signed up? It, it was taking the news was kind of involved and I'll share a little personal story about it. So I got the news and, and I was I was shocked. And, um, you know, Chris, you and I were talking earlier. I'm not a warmonger. I wasn't trying to be that guy. I'd say, please send me. But I honestly did feel like if I'm going to do this, I would want the experience of what it's like to, to be, you know, on the battlefield. And so I had tried all kinds of ways to include offering to take the tax center over to Afghanistan to open up so I could serve the soldiers there, just so I could get you some- You can tell me your mommy this. Yeah, well, mm. yeah, it's a little, okay. a lot. Um, but the toughest part about it was telling my family. And so, um, and, and the reason being, my dad's a Vietnam veteran. Uh, my mom was never too crazy. She knew I was going to do it, but she really wasn't crazy about me going to the military life. Um, she lived through dad being deployed. And so I think my first phone call was to, to Sheila to let her know. And you could tell she was just like, couldn't believe it. Um, but I wanted to tell her first so that she could prepare my parents uh, when I called them. And so I called. Um, she didn't say anything to him first, but I called. My mom answered the phone. My mom and I are very close. And that's that's the tough part. Um, and said, mom, um, I've got orders and I'm going to try Iraq. And also to kind of put in perspective, Iraq was really taken off at this point. And she paused and I could hear the hurt and fear in her voice when she said it. But like so many good military spouses are, she just kind of said, okay, you know, kind of do your job. And, 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 um, you know, I get choked up about it now. Um, it was tough. It was very tough because I just kept thinking she lived through this with her husband. I'd heard the stories about it and now she's doing it with her baby boy. And so that was just a really difficult time. Um, but you got to do what you got to do. And so we moved on. How much time did you have from that, from when you got noticed to when you left? So did you have time to prepare? Did you have time to spend more time with family or? No. And that's what was incredible. So this happened. Oh, I didn't tell you the story I passed out. And the day I found out I'm deploying, it was my birthday. So it was a great birthday present. And so May 3rd is my birthday. Um, and we were on a bird in Iraq, flying Iraq, I believe, June 10th, June 15th. So what else is unique about that at the time, at least, that was one of the fastest besides the 82nd Airborne, um, who was built to do this, the fastest time a brigade had gotten noticed, gotten trained, and got on the battlefield. Um, so it was a unique situation. Right. Wow. Okay. So it was, the war was called Operation Iraqi Freedom? Is Correct. Right? 2.5, okay. I believe it was. 2.5. That was our, our portion, yes. Okay. In Iraq, you were the, let me get this right command judge advocate what does that mean and you know what kind of duties and responsibilities did you have so the names kind of changed or what it what it what it was and what it is now and maybe gone back um at the time i was supposed to be the junior officer um because there was two jacks and and uh but things kind of changed around and so my role increased but essentially what it became was i was the senior legal advisor to the brigade commander um, how, where does the brigade commander? So, uh, all right. So brigade, um, usually you travel, well, 
not to get too technical, brigades tend to be one of the larger elements that go over overseas. Okay. Um, you know, you'll, you'll have a, a corps, and then right, a corps, brigade, then battalion, and on down. Well, the 10th Mountain Division probably had three three or so brigades, something like Correct. that. Correct. Oh, actually, we had four. four we went down to four <laughs> poles, so four. So we were a second brigade combat team. And so uh, uh, that's usually around, I think, two to 5,000, depending on you know, what unit might be. So somebody. you were the legal advisor to the head guy? Correct. Is that the way to say yep. it? Yep, okay. great commander. It be a girl, um, but it was a guy at the time, right? Correct. Oh, okay. 06, so which is right below the level of general. Right below. Okay, got it. All right. Can you tell us just a little bit about the living conditions, the working conditions at, at the compound? Well, it varied. Um, you know, when we first arrived, we actually were in Kuwait, which was extremely hot, um, living in tents, burlap tents. So you're sweating kind of dirty and nasty. Um, and then we traveled north to Iraq. And when we first got to Iraq, uh, we were in tents as well, actually, for a good amount of time. And then I don't know, you can see in some of the pictures, at some point we, we had a hard structure that was built, that was our headquarters. And then we stayed in basically kind of trailers, um, which was, you know, a step up from the tents. But nevertheless, you're still in pretty hot conditions. Um, and, you know, it can be tough. And that goes back to why you have to be in shape, uh, whether you're a JAG or anything else in the military. So as a lawyer, were you like in an office in these tents or what was going on? Where? Well, I guess that's where my story changes a little bit. Um, yes, I was for a large part of the time. I, I was in a tent. We had an office, whether it was in the tent or was it in, in the hard structure. Um, but my role kind of changed and morphed over time. And um, I don't want to get into it now, but I found myself on the battlefield quite a bit. Hmm. Okay. So were you afraid? Uh, forgive me for asking that question, but I've got, you know, um, how, how did you deal with or overcome fear? I'm, I'm assuming you were afraid. Oh yeah. I was stream. I mean, I think if somebody says they're not, something's wrong with them. Um, so yeah, I was terrified. Uh, you, you do get used to it. And I don't know if that's a good thing um, as time goes on. Uh, but yeah, I was terrified. I had a lot of close calls and um, I didn't take it for granted when I would leave to go out anywhere. Um, Is that close calls? Can you give us just one example, please? If, if, yeah, if I'll give you, you know so uh, one of them. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a man of faith and I will tell you, I can't tell you how many times the convoys we were on, either IED went off right before we got there, it blew up or right. IED? I'm sorry, uh, for those who don't may not know, I just want to make sure we're clear. Uh, improvised explosive device, right? Yeah. Um, a bomb, basically. And so it went off right before we got there or right after we left an objective. And so you know, I was nervous throughout, actually. I kept feeling like I was pressing my luck, that at some point I was going to be in one of those because there were just, just like kept happening uh, on a good amount of times. Uh, the other time was I was a part of a grenade attack, which actually led to uh, me getting my combat action badge, which at the time was fairly unusual thing for a Jack to receive. Uh, and basically just means for those who are not infantry soldiers, those who do the real fighting, uh, you've come under uh, combat, uh, come under fire from the enemy. So help us understand, why were you even in these trucks? Why were you going out? Why weren't you just sitting in your office? Part of it because I'm dumb. Um, <laughs> okay. No, what it really was is, back to the conversation with Chris, I just felt like if I'm there, I'm going to do the best I can to serve the people that I'm with, the other 4,000 or 3,000 soldiers that are there with me. And um, I developed a pretty close relationship with my commander and while I hope it's okay to say, I think he hated lawyers at first. Um, that was a tough kind of courting, but I believe uh, after a few instances, he saw the value and appreciated it. Uh, I mean, not just me, but what lawyers could bring to the table. And so after that point, he pretty much had me going on every combat mission we had. So that thing I think is unusual that I was there. Um, in fact, I can't think of too many that I didn't go on if there were any, uh, you know, once he kind of gained that trust in me. Interesting. So I will tell you from a family member perspective, um, it was scary. We prayed for you every day. I had my husband, my kids, we were always praying for you. My, my office, my law firm at the time was Case Scholler. I'll never forget. Um, they made an announcement when you went over there and they wished you good wishes. And people were always asking me and, and very just supportive, asking me how you were doing. Um, as a family member, I also say, I actually had the opportunity to speak with him while he was over there. There were times he would call. 
Um, and that was very special. And I would, you would usually call me at the office because that's where I usually was until late at night. Um, but it was like, I, I, it was a one way street. I couldn't call him. Um, he would call me. And so uh, like my secretary, shout out to Justine Dugan. Anytime Jamie called, she, she knew she had to find me and I would get on that call because it was that special and, and rare, frankly. And there was one incident I will just never, ever forget in my entire life. And yeah, <laughs> now I'm getting emotional. He called me and we were on the phone and I was asking him how he's doing. We got maybe into four minutes of the conversation. And then I heard this big bang a big explosion and the line went out. What happened that day? So if I recall, and, and, and forgive me because it's, it's been a few years, but I believe that's when we, um, there was a big IED that went off that literally shook all the Camp Liberty, which you're at. Um, and uh, I think that also might've been when we lost our first person. I got to check my facts on that, but I think we lost our first soldier there. In fact, I know we did, because here's the reason why it, it, the, the lines got cut. When somebody passes, you know, they don't want anybody to, they want the family to be notified that we've lost a service member. And so now it's might have changed since I've been in there, um, but the protocol was they cut the lines so that nobody can call home and tell them, hey, we've lost somebody until it's secure that the family has been notified that their son or daughter has been lost. And so that's what happened. And that's why the phone went dead. Um, but on their end, they don't know anything. And also, you got to remember, this is kind of cell phones are there, but not really not in Iraq. They weren't. And so we're calling over a military phone. Um, sound could be good or bad, depending on some days. And like she said, it's, it's a one way track. We're not calling up the phone and talking to one another on a regular basis. Scared me to death. But the and it took 24 hours, if I remember correctly. And I was like, I was in a situation where do I call my parents? Do I tell them this? I, it was just I gave him, I think, three hours to see if he'd call me back. He didn't. So I called my parents and I shared with them. They were worried to death. But um, it was a little over 24 hours later. We did get a call and found out that he was OK. Thank God. Um, let's go to the slides for a moment. I know you have some slides that we wanted to share with our audience. We thought we'd make it a little more accessible, if you will. So this is Jamie's story, his thoughts as a Black Jag's personal journey. Um, and there is a disclaimer, right, Jamie? I'll just put it up for everybody to see. Um, it represents his personal reflections. He's not speaking on behalf of the government or the army or even the city bar, frankly. <laughs> um, and so, and these are his, re his recollections. And I'm, I'm, again, Jamie, I'm very thankful that you've come today to share them with us. All right. So this is where it all started. You said you were stationed at Fort Drum, New York, right? Tell us what this is. So this is a picture, and most of these pictures you're going to see are mine. There's some that I got from our combat camera guys and some that just are commonly known pictures I have in there. But these are pictures um, of us getting ready to go. Now, I'm not in this may not be my actual unit here, but this is what it looks like. So you're on these military uh, airplanes and lots of times you'll see a flag hanging up and you'll see soldiers in there sleeping basically trying to get their rest um and that's actually uh there are other ways to travel but you'll see that and so uh we're, we're getting ready to do our thing essentially uh this right here is a unique picture and this is specifically our unit um as i talked about we're in kuwait first uh what happens is and or at least used to, we would travel from Kuwait and go up um, to drive through Baghdad or drive up to Baghdad or wherever else you're going. We were in Baghdad. What was unique also about our trip is that, and I don't remember how long it was, I want to say it was an overnighter, but uh, again, at the time, we were the first brigade to not have anybody lost on that journey going from Kuwait to uh, Baghdad. And so it's a really tense moment. Uh, we had some explosions go off a couple of times where we thought something was happening. Turned out there was it was nothing, thank goodness. But what's also unique about this picture, if you look closely, you can kind of see the door of our vehicles. And at if, if you remember, there was a big debate at the time about what the vehicles were supposed to be like. Right there, we're in what you call a soft shell, which means we did not have any up armor or armor on our vehicles, which means if we were hit, that was pretty much the end of it. And it was actually while we were there, we transitioned to to up armors because we were losing so many soldiers and IEDs and they realized we got to do something to protect service members. And so, uh, so that added to a fear. And when you get off there, by the way, my biggest fear of talking about being scared, I was very terrified. You would jump out of the vehicle, set up a security, 
there would be mines and things all on these routes. And so I was always terrified that I would get out and walk and lose my life, lose my legs or, or worse. Um, so that was a pretty scary time. This is, oh, they had a Burger King in Baghdad? They did, and Chris probably remembers it. Although, I'll be honest, I don't remember tasting as good as home. <laughs> it doesn't. Um, but, but we did. We had it. So, uh, you know, a little comfort to home there. Okay, just real quickly, what is that interesting building in the middle on the bottom row there? So that was the MF, MNFI headquarters. That was the core headquarters. Um, they kind of were the big shots, kind of controlling the whole battlefield. And so that's where all the top brass and so forth were. And uh, they controlled the battle, the battlefield, essentially. There. Okay, I might as well ask Oscar. What, to the left of that, what is, what is that? So like? the left, I believe this, you're talking about the Sabres. That's a very uh, famous, I can't remember the name of them right now. I don't know if Chris does, but that's a... We just called them the Cross Sabres. It was, I think it was parade grounds for, yeah. uh, for Saddam Hussein. I think that's yeah. right. That's right. But it's a pretty famous site. And inside is a picture um, of one of the palaces. It might have even been in, in that palace you see there, but... Uh, oh, that headquarters was one of the many palaces that Saddam Hussein had. And so uh, we kind of set up shop in a lot of their, their facilities. Got it. Okay. These are, I guess, pictures of some of the people. So did you have a chance to actually mingle and meet? And Oh, all the time. I mean, that was a large part of, of my job of, of meeting people and dealing with them, cultural exchanges and so forth. Um, so again, some of these pictures are not online here, but I also wanted to show you know, when you talk about Iraq, a lot of people think about the dust and the dirt and so forth, but it is literally the cradle of civilization. I mean, this is, some would say, is the Garden of Eden. And so I just wanted to show you, first of all, it's a beautiful place, even through, you know, the, the dust and, and off in the desert. It's a really beautiful place. And you have greenery like the picture you see on the right there. Uh, and very good people, too. This is your operating base, the Correct. headquarters. Correct. Hey, there you are. That was my pseudo oh. office in that top left corner picture. Um, and I lived in that little trailer there where you see the water and talking about conditions. Because it's a desert, when it rains and when it have torrential rains, the water could go up to our waist or higher. And so you're kind of stepping out of your door <laughs> into a bunch of water. And you did actually have, you're armed. Yes. Even as a lawyer. As a lawyer, that's right. Okay, more, more pictures of the headquarters. Right. Um, to go in a little bit about my job. And so I, I did several different things. Um, if you looked at that last picture where you see us sitting around a table, what's happening there, those are the, the senior staff people of the brigade. And so each one has a, a role, whether it's civil affairs, whether it's the legal, whether it's the fires teams who are responsible for sending the missiles down, down range, um, your intelligence people. And so we're all there with the commander and we're going over the events that have occurred or are about to occur in coming days, the missions we're about to have, and they're getting, you know, we're providing input and advice to the commander on what should or shouldn't happen. And what is this Claims and Government Information Center? So this is one reason why I was on the road so much is that at least twice a week, I would go out, um, the, the Foreign Claims Act provides that we give money to Iraqis or whatever country we're in if we damage their property or even worse if somebody dies or gets injured. And so Wait, civilians or military I civilians, mean, civilians. So, so the, the local, you know, the local civilians. And so, uh, you know, you can't put a price on somebody dying, um, but it does happen. And so there's different, different avenues to try to compensate the families for what their loss is. Or sometimes we would destroy an animal on their, you know, in their, their flock. Um, and what they would do, they'd have to come in. If you look at this picture in the top left, they're at a gate there. Um, they would come to a gate and they would say, hey, the U.S. did this to us. We want to get paid. And so essentially. And then the next picture, I'm inside with my, my team and we listen to what their argument is. And if we can find proof that we were actually there, um, you know, we check different things to kind of verify a fact our units were at that time in a certain place. Uh, and we kind of do an evaluation of the evidence. And if we think we did do that damage, then we will try to compensate them um, in some form or fashion. And so that's what I'm reviewing there. Uh, it's an interesting story about the picture of me in the middle of those two guys. I don't know this, so I don't want to defame them, but I, I was told uh, that these guys weren't necessarily good people. And we did have that problem that you had folks who were actually working for the enemy coming in, trying to get money, and that money would actually go back out to help fund IEDs and so forth. And so um, they were extremely polite, but in the only way, again, I don't know this for a fact, but people who worked in the center with me who were Iraqi came up after we 
had dealt with them and said, hey, we think these guys are linked to so and so. Okay, so the lawyer in me just has to ask this. So you said you verified to make sure you were there, but did they have to actually provide any evidence or proof as well? They do, yeah. Last okay. time they come with pictures or, you know, whatever they had. And then we would just do the best we can to look at it and, and make that determination. Got it, got it, okay. Uh, your commanders, you ask us if we recognize them. Chris, do you recognize these guys by any chance? I'm too far away. Oh, are you? Can you see that one? Uh, Not very well. I don't. All right, okay. give it to us. We don't. <laughs> so the gentleman on the left uh, happens to be the current Joint Chiefs of Staff. So he was a colonel at the time, that is General Milley. Um, I had a very close, rec very close uh, relationship with him during my time. I have the utmost respect for him, and I'm, I'm glad he is where he is, particularly with the things that we're dealing with today and in recent years. Um, and so the current Joint Chiefs of Staff was my brigade commander. Wow. And to the right, you see me with a picture with another gentleman who just made history in the last year, uh, who at the time was General Lloyd Austin and is now Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. Wow. So both of them are my commanders. He was my division commander. He came from... Uh, the whole division wasn't there, it was just our brigade. And so he came to visit us and I was kind of his pseudo escort while he was at the headquarters. And so that's the picture you see. And I got to spend some time with him and also a man that I have the utmost respect for. And we as a country are very, very, very lucky that we have these two men uh, where they are. Right. All right, these are just some pictures, combat. But this is you in particular. This was your first combat mission. Right, so uh, honestly, I know where we went, but I couldn't tell you the area. Um, but I did realize it was significant. It was the first time it was before I did anything. This was probably a month or so, maybe two, when I was in, uh, gotten to Iraq. And so, you know, I said, ask the guy to take a picture. It was the first time I'd gone out, what we call the wire, which is leaving the, the facilities. And um, that's what you have. Okay. What is this? So, what's interesting about my little career. Um, is that I just had these crazy opportunities. And so as I, I talked about kind of having this relationship with our brigade commander, uh, one day he comes and he had a nickname. I can go to the nickname right now, but he called me and uh, I want another he nickname. was like, Jack, uh, we'll keep that off. But he was like, Jack, uh, come with me. And that usually happened. He would go out somewhere and next thing you know, he's just Jack. And I had to run wherever he was and jump in the vehicle. This time we actually went to the green zone and unbeknownst to me, he was having a meeting with the interim uh, Iraqi president. So here I am, a baby captain basically, and the colonel's here, I'm here, and this head of state is right there. Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly what we talked about. I don't remember, I think we were preparing uh, for the elections, I believe was, was kind of the gist of the discussion. But it was just pretty amazing to hear I'm this little guy who had no foreign military experience, and I'm sitting here, to a leader of, a, of, the, of, a, of another nation. Okay, so, what's a green zone? So the green zone was kind of where all the diplomats and kind of where the heavies of the various uh, allied forces or, or coalition forces uh, that were kind of overseeing the whole operation in Iraq. And so it was heavily fortified. It got attacked a lot because that's where a lot of senior people were, both civilian and military. And that's where he was as the head of government. Okay, what's this? Election day. So what was very cool is that we got to see the first election um, in Iraq. We actually were a large part of the operation in terms of providing security for it, because as you can imagine, there was all kinds of threats and we did. We had things blow up and attacks and so forth. And so uh, our brigade with many others uh, set up protections so that the Iraqis could have free elections. And so these are some of the pictures from there. And you know, just, I'm gonna stop right here because we take this for granted as Americans. If you look at this picture in the middle, these people are walking to the polls. You know, we can't drive to the polls, but they're walking miles and miles in danger, all right, because a lot of people didn't want to see them voting. So they're jeopardizing their lives, but it was important to them. And so they got to the polls. And so inside, you see a picture, they're dropping their, their, their I guess it's a ballot, but they, they vote, which is interesting. Uh, the picture that they vote with ink. So they put this ink on their finger and then they, they hit the ballot on who they want to elect and then they drop it in the box. Um, and then that picture of me in the middle, we're back at the headquarters and that's where everything's being coordinated in terms of where our security forces are going. We're finding out people, you know, what attacks are going on. And so the chess match is happening in the center to make sure there's a safe and secure election. And for the most part, it was. What's in that bottom left-hand corner? 
That's the picture I'm talking about. That's if you can't see closely, but if you look at his finger that he's holding up, there's purple ink on his finger, and that's how they voted. And I thought it was a pretty cool picture to see. Got it. Actually, Chris, you want to take over? You sure. Through some more slides. Yeah, sure. So, how long were you in Iraq total? So, you know, I debated this with one of my buddies, and I hope they're listening. Um, you know, one to to Doc and to our XO two of the finest men I've ever served with. And I, and I appreciate your friendship even to this day. Uh, but we were there 365 days. I think we actually, I was actually there with, with some others, I believe it was around 377 days. I was on the last, what we call chalk to come home with the headquarters company. And so uh, we went beyond that 365 because we were there kind of cleaning up and make sure things are ready. And forgive me, Chris, I actually wanted you to go ahead and finish up the slides if you don't mind. Oh, you can ask him about the reconnaissance. Oh, sure. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I'm having a hard time seeing, seeing? Okay, but that's no, okay. No yeah. So, uh, I guess were you were you part of um, um, a reconnaissance mission? I was. Yeah. I shouldn't have been. Um, and and I was going to tell you the comments. So, uh, like I said, I shouldn't be on the battlefield as much as I was, <laughs> but I was. All right. I had my code name was Commando Jack. We were the commandos, uh, Second Break, Tenth uh, Mountain, and so our XO who. To tell you a little about this guy, he's Delta Force, those of you familiar with the military, um, the elite of the elite, um, the most outstanding person I've probably ever served with. And, but a little crazy, sorry, sir, if you hear this. Um, and he said, Jack, come on. And so I'm like, all right. And so I get in the vehicle, we're at that night. And he takes me and he, I was like, you know, where are we going? And he says, Solder City. Well, at that time, you talk about bad neighborhoods, that's the worst neighborhood you could go into in Iraq at the time. The surgeon field, they controlled it. So what the plan was, and you can read it on your own at some point, but the first battle of Fallujah, everybody's heard about it. The Marines went in and it was very bloody and so forth. Well, then we had a second one. And what our original mission was, there was kind of like a burn, for lack of a better word, kind of a cliff or hill or mound. And what we were going to do is essentially pin the surgeons in. That was the original plan. We we're going to pin the surgeons in. The Marines were coming from the other side and basically meet in the middle and, and, and wreck shop. And uh, we were going to do it. And so he took me, for whatever reason, as a lawyer, I thought it was a good idea that I would go on this reconnaissance mission. And so after all these years, I finally just asked him, hey, sir, why did you take me on this mission? I'm not an infantry soldier. I don't have, I'm not a combat engineer like you were. And this is his response. First, he tells me, I took you so you would see the complexity of the battle space. And that's legitimate because what he was trying to teach me as the lawyer, because I was making decisions about who we attacked, how we attacked, or I shouldn't say making decisions, providing advice on it. A lot of people don't realize every war, every battle that you see, there's a JAG somewhere or several JAGs there. They're there advising the commanders on what they can or can't do. So for example, we talk about Ukraine right now. There, if, if it was flipped on the other side, there should be a JAG there telling Putin or whoever our US commander is, Yes or no, you cannot hit that school. Yes or no, you cannot hit that church. And so that's the world that we're playing. A lot of people don't realize that. So that's why there are Jags on the battlefield, like myself. Not many. Most of us are able to stay in the office, I think, most of the time. But there are some that are there. And so he took me because he knew I was here making these type of decisions, and he wanted me to understand. The flip side of what he said, though, and I will quote, also, I figured I could use you as a human shield, or you could advise me to not commit a war crime. That's his, his quote. So that's how I found myself there. And um, the mission actually didn't happen in the end. And I will share with you, part of it was, it was determined there's gonna be so many casualties from that effort that they went a different course with it. Um, but that's what we were doing. Did you find that the longer you were in country and the more, um, the more combat missions you were a part of that your commander brought you in on, did you, did you, did you feel your confidence in giving him advice uh, improve because of you were getting that combat experience? Definitely. It's like anything else. You, you do it, you get more experience. But the problem is this is war, right? There's no book really on, particularly for Jags, on you do this in this situation and do this in that situation. So you're depending on, for me, honestly, I depended a lot on my training in RTC. I was so thankful I went through that route. Um, I think that's where I got a lot of the soldier part. Uh, General Milley made sure that every one of us qualified like there's some units that you know they kind of rubber stamp people getting qualified to go so i did all the training that the, the infantry guys were doing fired all the weapons the infantry guys were doing he made us all do that so that we could take care of ourselves and handle our business when we got there 
And so that helped. And then the rest of it was, like you said, you're learning as you go. You, you're not forgetting your legal mind either, right? So law school comes into play and your experience as a lawyer. And so even though this is the toughest time of my life, professionally, or just in general, it was probably the best time of my life in the sense of I use everything I had in my toolkit to survive and more importantly, to help my team survive. So professionally, academically, soldier-wise, all those came together in that one point. And so uh, I was thankful, but yes, I got better. You know, if I looked at some decisions or some advice I gave early on, probably do a little different, but uh, you, you do, you improve as things go on. You want to tell us about Operation Commando Freeze? I will. So this is one of the missions we had. Uh, I'm not going to go into a bunch of details, but uh, if you can look in the middle picture there, what, what stands out to me when I look and think about this is, one, we're in like blown out buildings. And so we're living outside in the heat. Uh, I believe this mission lasts between seven to 10 days, if I recollect. But all those vehicles, kind of hard to see in the picture, those are Iraqi soldiers and vehicles. And that's all good and dandy. But those who have traveled to foreign countries and dealt with some of the foreign soldiers, what's not cool is they have celebratory fire. So they like to fire their weapons straight up in the air. Well, the problem with that is those bullets come down, all right? And so you're always worried you're going to get hit. But the more serious side of that is you honestly don't know who you can trust when you're co-located with these units. So we know there were some, I mean, maybe not these guys, but in some units, we had people that were not friendly to us and were doing things to counteract us. So uh, we went there and, and basically it was to kind of, you know, find a surgeon, basically. But I, I remember once... Um seen quite a bit of fire at nighttime and we were concerned and it turned out that the Iraqi soccer team had just beaten the Iranian soccer team. There you go. <laughs> yeah, for example. It wasn't combat, it was celebratory. It was exactly. celebratory, exactly. Go back one slide you know, if you can. I did want to point out that top picture of myself and that general right there, that was the number one general in Iraq at the time, General Muhammad. And so uh, they, like I said, this was a joint operation that we did. And so in that building there is where we were planning and putting together. And so I got the opportunity to meet them and took a picture and it was just kind of a unique, unique experience. Another one of our major missions, which was actually towards the end of our tour, uh, was when we did an air assault. And air assault sounds fancier than it is, but basically just means you're using helicopters in some form or fashion to integrate or to, to infiltrate a particular area. You could repel out the helicopters, you could land with the helicopters, basically using the helicopters. Why is um, it called the Triangle of Death? So, because that's where people were getting killed a lot, basically. It was a very bloody area. And so that was a pretty risky operation, which again, we did this operation literally right before we went home. Um, I had a little stomach ache about that because usually most units are kind of winding down when they're getting ready to go and you're switching out with the new unit coming in. Uh, but to General Milley's credit, what he recognized was you can't let up against the enemy. You can't show that you're taking a break. And so, we actually kind of went on the offensive and literally we packed up and left on birds within three days of coming back from that mission, which is almost unheard of. All right. This is one of the interesting stories you had. Tell us about, and I cannot pronounce the journalist's name. Juliana Sergulina. Thank you. How you pronounce it. Uh -huh. Okay. And how, how were you involved with this? So, um, <sighs> Got to be careful how to answer this one, but I will tell you what essentially happened was we had a gentleman at or soldiers at a checkpoint, and the general protocols were if a vehicle was coming by, you would give them warnings on how to, you know, to get them to stop. You would yell, you would flash lights, you might fire some warning shots. There's a whole thing that we go through. Um, unfortunately, this vehicle is coming down what we called at the time right uh, Route Iris, which was also called IED Highway because that was where the most IEDs had gone off in the whole country of Iraq. And so our guys were stationed there and this vehicle comes screaming down the, the road. There's a ramp that goes on to this, this highway. Our soldiers did everything they could to try to get this vehicle to stop. The vehicle didn't stop and they shot it up. Uh, the end result was uh, we had an Italian general that was killed, an intelligence general that was killed and this journalist, uh, Mr. Greena, and it became a big international, international incident. If you go back and Google it, or we're looking at the news at the time, you could see that the Italians and, and we were not getting along too well because of this incident. Um, rumor had it, and I don't know this for a fact, so I'll be clear, 
the the soldiers that were involved in that, if they were to touch their ground in Italy, they could have been arrested for this incident. Um, they were arguing that it was unprovoked. They didn't do you know the right things, and so they had this huge investigation. Um, and so I got involved to answer your question, Sheila, uh, because of that investigation. Uh, they were targeting certain people, and I kind of came in uh, and kind of worked with the gay perspective and how how it went down. Got you. Ah, so. Can you share with us, and I know the story, but I, I think it's important for you to share with people, um, what main contribution or accomplishment during, during your tenure in the Iraqi war are you most proud of? And I know it concerns this gentleman. Yeah, I'm most proud of this probably my whole career as a lawyer, period, um, not just Iraq and so forth. And, and um, so, uh, you don't see the picture here, but another thing I give General Milley credit for is that he always, always, as soon as he knew a service member was hurt, one of his guys, he went to them. It was usually at the cash or the, the hospital. Um, but wherever they were injured, he was going. And so, again, most of the times I went with him when he was going. And I'll never forget this one time I go with him. And he walks into the hospital room and I see this young man who's kind of unrecognizable quite honestly um unfortunately he had uh, been the victim of an ied and so for those of you who haven't seen this and i don't want to be too vivid but i also want to be vivid enough so you guys understand what's really happening to our soldiers when they're on the battlefield what a lot of people don't know is when your body takes that type of blow in a lot of instances it expands so i walk in and i see this young man who is you know, obviously was a very fit soldier looking like me, basically, at this point and bigger and all black and blue. His body had just and, and it's one of the most horrific scenes I'd seen. And uh, General Milley's there to talk to him. Uh, he, he awards him his Purple Heart, I believe, there, if I remember correctly. And it, it shook me. And so anyway, what this led to is uh, we, we left and we had gotten a call that you know, it wasn't looking good and he wasn't going to make it. And so there was a decision to be made like, well, do we tell the family now? Do we reach out to them? Um, you know, kind of what do we do? And, and, you know, the colonel uh, generally really now was concerned about, well, what do you mean? What do we do? And so he comes to me and says, Jag, well, you know, what do we do? Do we have a responsibility to notify the family now or do we let them die? Do we do it? Basically a DNR situation, those are familiar, right? And DNR, do not resuscitate. And, and so to your question, Chris, about do you get better and what do you learn? Well, there's no rule book to tell you what do you do when you're looking at a dying soldier and what to do. But so I, I, I get called in. Actually, we're still at the hospital. I, I'm at the hospital. I get called into this room and I'm a captain. And in the room, I believe there's at least two general officers, Colonel Milley, I believe another colonel or two. I'm it. I'm the baby guy in there. And all of they're talking about this. And then the last thing I know is, Captain Boston, what do you think? What do we do? And I'm like, I'm the most junior guy in here. What do you mean, what do we do? And, and, and I don't have a playbook for this. I don't know. And so I paused and I just had to think about actually my parents. What would my parents want to happen if I was in this situation? And so I said, I think I was like, I don't know the, the law per se on this. I know what happens in DNR situations back home in a regular situation, but this is combat. I really don't know. But I kind of pieced that together with, again, what would my parents want to do? And so I told him, I said, if there's any chance you can contact his family now and ask them what do they want to have happen, we owe that to them. And so they did it. And what was remarkable, that turned into a, a stand operating procedure for the whole theater of Iraq and Afghanistan. That's one thing that I'm most proud of. I, I have that, that order that came out, an unclassified version of it. Um, but the second part, the more remarkable part is, remarkable part is, I'm in Iraq 2004, 2005 when this happens. About two years later, I'm actually here in New York visiting my sister. And I'm at one of their Memorial Day picnics, cookouts. And I just happened to go inside and look at, it was CNN and they were doing, you know, their typical CNN specials. And they're talking about these soldiers and they start talking about this story and this one soldier in particular. 
And I'm like, hmm. And the next thing I know, there's these parents talking about losing their son, and how difficult it was. But the one thing they said was they were so thankful to the army, to the military, for how they treated them. And, and they went in kind of to talking about them and what happened to their son. And so the next clip I see the gravestone and it's that same soldier that I helped. And so I've never met them. And, and I hope I really did make a difference, but to know that um, I will tell you to help anybody in that way, um, I'll never forget it. And, and it's, uh, I'll never forget him either. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and you, you were like, Sheila, Sheila, come look at this on CNN. And um, yeah, I'm very proud, very proud. All right, let's leave the walk. <laughs> okay, Chris. Well, we, we could probably, have a whole conversation on the role of JAG, right? And, and, and certainly you could speak to the role of the JAG officer in combat and often commanders will, it, it might not be a legal question whatsoever, but when they don't know who to ask, they turn to the JAG, to the JAG because they respect their opinion. And, and you're someone who probably went to law school thinking you can make a difference, joined the army thinking you can make a difference, and here you are doing both at the same time. So that, that's Trying. great. Yeah. Trying. So you came back home in June of 2005, is that correct? Correct. Uh -huh. You said before that was a little, a little over a year, right? Yeah, a little over a year. Okay. And like I said, according to our good XO, he said he thinks it's around 377 days that we were there. Did you redeploy back to Fort Drum or somewhere else? Went back to Fort Drum. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Yeah, went back to Fort Drum. How, how much longer were you at Fort Drum? Not long, because um, I actually came back and I was actually planning a wedding while I was over there. So I came back in June and I was married in August. So there was a lot going on. What was, it, what was, uh, what was your next assignment? So my next assignment was, uh, I was sent down to Fort Lee, Virginia. Closer to home? Closer to home. I uh, thought it was great. My dad was a quartermaster officer. So I was in his old stomping grounds, which is where the home of the quartermaster school is. So life was good as far as I was concerned. Um, having a good time. What was that? What was your duty assignment there? So I had two jobs there. The first one, because I was actually there a little over four years, I believe. And so the first assignment, I was a trial defense attorney. And so that's uh, kind of what it sounds like. You are the public defenders for our service members who get in any type of trouble. And did, did, so you were, did you, before um, working in trial defense, did you have any um, time as a, as a military prosecutor? I did. Very short stint. Um, but I was pretty green when it came to the courtroom. I, uh, I was a prosecutor for, I don't know, whatever that last month or two I had when I was at Fort Drum. So I think I did a couple cases before I left. Um, so to go to TDS right away was, was rough because being a TS attorney, you're starting down at the bottom in terms of your, your evidence and how to help your soldier. And so, it, you know, it, it's tough. And so it's nice to have more experience for going into that. But it, I was baby, a baby counsel, and so I just had to go for it. And it in the, um, in the civilian lawyer world, this, there are plenty of people who are prosecutors and then leave and become defense counsel. Can you talk a little bit about doing that in the Army as well, if there are opportunities like that for, for military JAGs? Yeah, for you people out there who are looking at the JAG Corps, the beauty about the JAG Corps and one of the strengths, in my opinion, uh, particularly the Army, sorry to slight anybody else, but you get the opportunity to be a prosecutor and defense counsel if you want to be. And I highly recommend it. I don't care from the day you're born, you want to be a defense counsel. If you have the opportunity to be a prosecutor, to be on the other side of the aisle, it's going to make you that much better of a defense counsel and vice versa. And so uh, a lot of us in the JAG Corps get that opportunity. And so I did that for a lot of my career. I went back and forth. Well, um, but since you said it seems like you spent more of the time um, in defense counsel, did any, can you re reflect on any uh, memories as defense counsel, any important cases that stand out? Yeah, actually, technically, I think it was more prosecution, but um, at some memorable times as a defense counsel. And so one of them was the Aubrey Gray Prison Center. What, what was your role with that? So I was one of the, the primary defense counsel for that case. Uh, well, there was multiple cases. I think there was 11 people that were prosecuted for that. My client was one Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Jordan, L. Jordan, who was the highest ranking officer that was court martial um, for any offenses related to the Aubrey Gray prison scandal. Um, 
highly charged. You can even go on there now and find tons of articles and so forth. Um, it was a tough day, I think, for, for the American military, American uh, psyche too, and um, created a lot of problems. Can, can you talk about, because I'm sure, you know, this is something that, that even civilian lawyers deal with, especially civilian defense lawyers, but maybe you're situated differently when you're in the military because you, you joined the military to uphold certain values and then you abide by a creed, and now you're defending, uh, you know, people involved in, in, in this scandal. Yeah, it's, it's really tough. Um, I didn't want to be a defense counsel just to give you a little side, just because, you know, I kind of didn't want to defend people that I thought were potentially guilty, yeah, honestly. But I will tell you, it's probably one of the best jobs I've ever had, uh, because you realize it's not so much, at least my position is, it's not so much about you're always trying to prove that person is innocent or not. What, what you're really trying to do is make sure the system is held accountable, and it does what it's supposed to do. So if they're guilty, then hopefully they do get punished. They get punished with the right type of, of punishment. It's not unfair. But there are cases where somebody is wrongfully accused. And I would submit my client in this case, there was actually one, two, three of us on, the, on this case. Um, and I would submit that he was wrongfully uh, uh, charged. Forgive me, Jamie. Let's go back just for a hot yeah. second. Can you? What are these pictures and what were the allegations, just in case people don't so, know? So, yeah, so time, it's, you know, it's a long time ago. So, yeah, so these pictures are of Iraqi detainees who were just put through gruesome and, and grotesque experiences. Um, they were essentially tortured to a certain level, as someone argue. And, you know, here, Iraqis, uh, or at least how we were taught, that Iraqis aren't too fond of dogs. And so you have a picture here, for example, one of the dog handlers having a dog up in his face. Um, you have this gentleman that was being forced to stand on, I think it was a box. And I don't know, it's not in this picture, but he was holding things that look like wires. So they were playing all these type of mind tricks and sometimes physical things. Like they were having to sit there for hours and, and so forth. So terrible stuff, that stuff that we shouldn't be doing. And so is that the slide that's up now, is it, was this one of your clients? Yep. So that's Colonel Jordan right there. And so I'm a little swollen in that picture. Um, cause I think I hadn't been working out cause I was working on the case so much. But we're walking into what I believe was our first hearing, and that was held at uh, the military district of Washington at Fort McNair. And so, uh, you know, the thing about that, in, in all these high profile cases, they're shooting pictures of you all the time. And they're not always the most flattering <laughs> positions to be in, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's unique to be in those type of situations. And so this is a, a rendering. You can kind of see me on the end of the table there. And this is when we actually start trial uh, for the case, which was in August. How long did that trial last? We went uh, seven days, seven days for the, the findings in terms of uh, you know, guilt or innocence. And then we came back, I think over a weekend later on and did the sentencing. Counted in. Yeah. <laughs> Counted in. So <laughs> long story short, uh, we got them off. Uh, one of the things that came up in that case, you know, they were arguing that Colonel Jordan was kind of the one that oversaw this, allowed all these bad things to happen. And uh, one of the things that I hated this because I, I, I never got quoted for it, but in that hearing, I think it was at, at Fort McNair, we'd come up with a strategy of, look, he was essentially what we call the mayor of the FOB or, or the post. And his job was basically just make sure morale was right, make sure, you know, it was protected properly, make sure they, you know, they had food and so forth. And so uh, I remember standing up and saying, well, so essentially he was the mayor of Abu Ghraib. He wasn't in charge of all the, you know, the interrogation and so forth. And that's debatable. I'll, I'll be honest with you. He, he did have a little bit of an intel background. And so that's kind of why they, they kind of latched onto him. Personally, and again, only my personal thought, I don't think they have the evidence to show that he really was the one that did it. And fortunately, the, the um, jury agreed with this. He did essentially get, get uh, convicted of one crime, um, and I believe that was for talking to one of the witnesses or something about, it. I can't remember exactly what it was, but even that one, we were able to get dismissed later on. And so he basically walked away free and went, was able to retire and is living a good life in another part of this country. Right. And you stayed in touch with them after, uh, I have, yeah. I have, yeah, we, we talk every now and then kind of the whole legal team, because that was two plus years, if I remember correctly, of, of sweat and tears. And so we came, uh, very tight. I was the initial person on that case. And again, to show how tie, things tie in, I think it was because when I was in Iraq, I actually had gone to Abu Ghraib on, on one of the missions. And so I think they kind of said, well, look, this guy at least familiar with the place. 
And so I got put on as the, the attorney and then we uh, motioned to have two other additional attorneys who came on who were more experienced, which I'm great, glad they were there. And, but the three of us um, went to work on trial. In, in the civilian world as lawyers, we sometimes, I mean, it takes five, 10 years sometimes to, to feel like you're becoming a, a subject matter expert in a practice to you to go from a year of advising a commander in combat to then being defense counsel in a, in a high profile trial. What, what's that transition like to, to switch gears like that? It's hard. It's very hard. I mean, one, because that meant I didn't get to rest. Like I, life was good when I got there, but this case came in, you know, not too long, maybe six months after. So I'm still trying to unwind from being in war for a year. Um, and so it's hard and you are, you're, you're changing your skill sets, right? And so you're going from the all of, you know, all purpose soldier, lawyer to now, it's really about what you can do in the courtroom. And so you got to figure that out. And again, that's why I was so thankful. I had uh, my two co-counsel, Sam Spitzberg and Chris Poppy. And to, to highlight how that was too, by the way, when I got that case, I literally had phone calls from friends saying, it's been nice working with you. And I was like, what are you talking about? And the word on the street, and I don't know if it's true, but the word on the street was, hey, this is a career killer. You know, kind of your point about defending certain people and so forth. If you touch this case, there's a good chance, you know, and I don't know if it's true, I, you know, being older and, and experiencing more, I'm not so sure it was true, but that was kind of the talk at the time. And so in the back of my mind, this whole time I'm thinking again, for the second time in my early career, I'm thinking it's over before it starts. Um, but fortunately, it turned out the way. And the system is a good system. And so I was able to continue on with my career and think it went all right. It's, 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 it is a challenge. I, I'm in, in my reserve capacity. I do defense counsel work. So I, I, have, I don't have the experience you've had. But, but on the one hand, you're serving the United States. But when you're def your client is your client who's charged with those crimes, not to, you know, your client right. is no longer the United States in that situation. Right. So. Which is very unique. And we're not influenced by the command. It is right. completely what we do for the client. So where were you off to after Fort Lee? So after Fort Lee, finished the trial, um, short stint, I actually was a professor of contract fiscal law um, at the Army Logistics University, which was a cool job. I would say I did get a little bit of a breath there. Um, and then I left uh, Fort Lee and went and deployed to Korea. With the, again, the famous 2nd Infantry Division, second to none. That's right. right? What was your role in, in, uh, in Korea? So there I went back to being a prosecutor. So I was what we call the chief of military justice, which is essentially uh, equivalent of a U.S. attorney or the DA for a particular city. And so you're, you're overseeing a group of attorneys and making sure bad people are getting prosecuted. And can you tell us about any of your casework while you were in Korea? So Korea, it's a one year tour for most people unless you extend. And so it's a lot going on. There's a lot of young soldiers in a foreign country, a lot of liquor and things. And so it gets a little rowdy to be away from their with families, away from their, their families. families. Um, you know, young soldiers are living their best life ever. All right. Uh, I don't want to paint the picture that they're just being undisciplined, but they're having a good time. And so things happen. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of rape cases or some type of, of sexual assault type cases. So that was a large part of our docket. Um, but some of the ones that kind of stood out, we had a situation where a very senior enlisted officer, senior uh, Sergeant Major, had assaulted his, uh, his driver. Um, and you know, that was unusual because it was male on male. And so you can imagine kind of the backdrop to that discussion. And so, um, and also that he was the high profile service member. Um, he did get convicted. I can't remember the punishment, but he did get convicted. Uh, we had a huge, um, kind of hazing scandal that went on, uh, that, uh, there are some rituals aren't, they're not legal. So I want to be clear. They're not legal, but certain units have certain rituals. And that was going even beyond what was even somewhat uh, okay. Actually, it's never okay, but that was happening. So we ended up having to prosecute, I think it was six or seven different service members, senior people, um, not too senior, but you know, leaders uh, for, their, for their actions. And some of them lost their careers and some of them uh, did a little time. And so that was, uh, it was kind of a big deal. It was kind of all over the papers when we were over there. <laughs> And just so we're keeping track of, of your career as we're moving through this, uh, are you, you were, were you sent over there initially as a captain? Uh, were you on your way to making major? I was. Uh, it, was a, it was a very unique, uh, challenging time because I was a captain and so were all my subordinates. And, you know, you, you normally call each other captain by your first name when you're the same rank. 
So I had to lead people with the same rank, uh, which was challenging. I had a few dust ups, to be honest with you, uh, to get them to understand, hey, yeah, I know I'm a captain like you, but I, I'm kind of the boss right now. And so that was challenging, but I had a good team. And we, in, in the end, worked it out and had a great, uh, we did well over there. We did really well. Very proud of the work that we did as, as prosecutors. And I think we have a slide up now of your uh, promotion to major. Right. So I come back from Korea and I go to the grad course, uh, the graduate course, which is at your mid-level when you're hitting around that 10 year mark where you're deciding whether you're going to kind of stay in in most cases or go ahead and punch your ticket and get out. Uh, if you want to stay in, you got to get your LLM. And so they send you to Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, that's yeah. one of the opportunities. Can I have you hold on one quick second? I remember you told me a story about your promotion. There was somebody you really wanted to be there or who was supposed to be there and he wasn't. And then you later found out. Yeah. Where he so, was. so by this point, Colonel Milley had now become General Milley. <laughs> and I'd asked him to be the person to pin me on and promote me or do my promotion ceremony. Um, and he said, with the nickname, he called me. Um, I want to find that out yeah, later. I'll do it. You know, I'll do it. And so I was very excited. He was coming down. And it's a big deal when one of the generals come down to the jazz school. And so they were doing all these preps and, and so forth. And then the last minute, I get a message. I don't remember it was him directly. I think it was from the aide. Says, sorry, can't come. And I was pretty upset about that because I thought, you know, maybe I thought too much of myself. But I thought we were close enough that he was going to make it. And um, had no idea what happened. Well. I look on the news a day, maybe two later, we had killed Osama bin Laden. <laughs> and he was working in the Pentagon, the Joint Chiefs at that time. And so putting two and two together, he said he was busy. I'm assuming he was busy because he was working on that mission. <laughs> so that's why he didn't get to promote me. Okay, where did you go next? So I came back, uh, went back to being prosecutor again. I was another chief of military justice at the Military District of Washington, which is, uh, many would say, the most complex uh, jurisdiction, uh, military justice or criminal law jurisdiction, because we cover people like the CIA, the White House, all the generals that are in those different places. And so you have a lot of high-level cl uh, clientele or, or people that could get in trouble, I guess you'd say. Um, and we also span around the globe. And so it's a unique place to, to be a part of as a criminal law guy. Okay, I'm going to jump quickly because yeah, Ooh, we had more we wanted to cover, but let's yep. do what we can. So you were involved with WikiLeaks, and I think most people know about that. Yeah, um, so I'll do it really us. short. Yeah. Um, Private uh, PFC Bradley Manning, uh, now known as Chelsea Manning, had been court-martialed. I was I didn't do the grunt work. Uh, I'll be clear about that. I was again the chief of military justice, so you know, there were my subordinates. There were actually the the legal team that did it, but I was involved in probably 95% of the strategy for the case and the meetings on it. And so, um, you know, we had somebody who had access to classified information and decided to leak that classified information. And at the time it was, uh, it predates Snowden, but at the time it was the largest leak of classified information in history. And so you can imagine it was a pretty big deal and a lot of time and effort, particularly from the members who directly worked on it, um, they worked their their butts off basically, and uh, you know did pretty well with the case. Maybe not as much as some people wanted, but they they did well with it. So I do want to note, um, you know, with your last JAG assignment, you served as the command judge advocate for the 419th Contracting Support Brigade right. in Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. And I remember you sharing with me that you planned, managed, and administered over well, your group did, 13,000 contract actions, totaling over 1.5 million, billion, mm -hmm. excuse me, billion with a B, dollars. So the government actually has a lot of contracting work yep. and yeah. involved in that, right? Right. And so, you know, you just think about it. Every computer system we get, every weapon system we get, the food that we get, all that's done through some type of contract. And so that's coming through these, these types of brigades. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you get to see a lot there. And, uh, I did that because I had gotten my LLM in contract fiscal law at the grad school. Um, so. so as JAG, you started out with tax, then you did kind of like war criminal stuff, then you're doing contracts. Wow, okay, amazing. So after your, I think it's 12 years of service? Just about. Almost, All right, yep. you retired from JAG. Um, why did you retire, if you don't mind sharing? I medically retired, um, and this is something that is kind of interesting, the timing, but 
I'm mainly retired. Uh, out of the blue, I had a, what I thought was a decent career. Things are going well. Even though I'm a big guy, I've always been a big guy. I could run pretty well for my size. I started noticing I, I couldn't run as well as I used to. I thought I was just getting older. Long story short, I got diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, and that essentially railroaded my career like that. And so I went from progressing to pretty much out of the army in a matter of months with never being sick before, never broken anything, never been in a hospital before to probably what, two or three years of hospital appointments and uh, hospital stays, um, which can't prove it, but I su suspect it's from my, my time in Iraq. Um, and what ties in, if you just heard that the president of the VA just announced that certain cancers are now um, being looked upon as presumptive or uh, because of their time in Iraq. And while I don't have the cancer, one of those ailments is on there. And so I suspect that my, my illness came from that. But time will tell. I suspect that it will be kind of like an Agent Orange type situation for me. I might, it might be 20 years from now before it happens, before they actually make the official link. Um, I think it's a good possibility. Well, and you know, I'm, I was sad about that. Um, but overall, did you enjoy your experience as a JAG officer? I would recommend it to anybody. But you have to know what you're there for. I never, and people might differ about this. I always thought of myself as a soldier before a lawyer when I was in the JAG Corps. And so if you do that, I think you're going to find yourself in a better situation. And I think it mentally prepared me for the situation you kind of brought to me earlier, Chris. Some people go in, hey, I'm just a lawyer. And that's the mentality they have while they're there. And when they're called to fire a weapon or when they're called to answer one of these life or death situations, it can be tough for them. And so that's my advice to any law students out there, or anybody getting ready to go to the JAG Corps, is know what you're getting yourself into. You know, the reality is you are there to serve this nation, whatever that requires. And so be prepared for that. Chris, let's quickly. Yeah, sure. Well, well, next. <clears throat> why don't you just quickly touch on um, your transition out of the military into your civilian role, what that job was, and and, yeah. and how if if it all how the transition was, and if the the military helped you um, in your civilian career. If I'm being fr frank, it was hard. I mean, I, you understand, I wanted to be a JAG. That was, since that 11th grade year, that was the job I wanted for life. And I achieved it and I loved it. I had my ups and downs, but I loved it. And to lose it like that, without any preparation, without anything, and we don't have time to go through the whole process, but it's a tough process. But it also has filled why I'm such, why I'm into veterans advocacy and doing things for veterans now, because of my experience with that. Um, so I guess God had a bigger plan for me, but it was very hard. And, you know, you go through some of these slides and this is some of the stuff I was able to experience. And, and I'm not a hot shot. There's people out there who've done probably tons of greater things I do. So I don't want to paint that picture. Like I, you know, I'm, I'm this great guy, but I thought I had a decent resume. He is a great guy. Just so all right. you all know. Um, I had done some pretty cool things, but honestly, it wasn't that easy to jump and get a job afterwards uh, because some of it was people don't understand, oh, you're JAG, well, you don't practice real law. So some people didn't want to look at me because of that. I mean, you look at the firms. Also, I want to stop right here. You firms out there, all right, you've just seen a little snippet of my life. And there's people done, like I said, things greater than I have. Hire our, your JAG attorneys out here. They're doing things. I like to put it this way. We can do what you do. You can't do what we do. All right. And so you saw what I've done and, and, and you can't tell me I can't go to any firm here and sit in front of any courtroom or sit in any board meeting, not get clients, not talk to clients. So hire them. So when you see a JAG attorney and if you don't understand what they do, take the time and ask them what they do because you'd be surprised what you're going to learn. All right. That's just my little public thing service announcement. From them, yeah, all right? okay. <laughs> um, but, but the transition was hard. And um, I, I first went to, uh, the attorney general's office for the state of Maryland. And I did organized crime. So I went back to my criminal roots there and I loved that job. Uh, and I was kind of uh, attacking the heroin epidemic that we're going through. Do we want to touch on uh, what I think is a pretty interesting yeah, part of your should. career? The, uh, so, the al -Sayed? Yeah, so this is, if any of you, I didn't know anything about this, by the way, when I was doing this, but um, there's a thing called the Serial Podcast that apparently was a pretty big deal. I'm not really a podcast guy. And so I get thrown into this case. Now, I was not a lead person on here, so I don't want to paint the wrong picture. But uh, I think Chris was asking me before we started, like, you know, how your military training, your JAG training helped you? Well, I think 
my office was able to identify pretty early besides hiring me that the litigation experience I had gained from being in Jack Corps put me in a position where I could jump on pretty much anything. And so, and they also saw from my work product, there are certain ways that we do things in Jack Corps. We're really detailed in how we brief our cases and, and how we set up our evidence and so forth. And so uh, I was in the office late one night working and the deputy attorney general comes in and he's like, Jamie, you know, what about this? And we started talking about this particular instance of the case. Long story short, I get thrown on to the team uh, and they recruited other people because it was a big deal. And so I got thrown onto this serial podcast case, which was terrible. Um, this young lady that you see here uh, was murdered and they arrested an ex-boyfriend as a person they thought by the name of uh, Nasayad, who they believe is the one who, who killed her. And so my particular part of it, they had a series of re-hearings. You can read this, I'm not gonna go through it, but you can read it, they had some re-hearings. The argument there in the re-hearings were two main things. One, that there was a witness that his defense counsel at the time did not question, and it related to cell tower information. Because one of the things why the government said he was the one that did it is we looked at the cell tower information and kind of triangulated that it was probably him based on the cell phone information. Well, the defense counsel did not uh, really cross-examine that particular witness well. There was also an alibi witness out there that was not uh, reached out to or not called. And so as you guys can imagine, you lawyers out there can imagine that led to an ineffective assistance of counsel um, claim. And when that happens, it can get your case turn, or turned over basically. And so my part of this, my little small part of this was actually look at that issue and try to determine in fact, was there ineffective assistance of counsel? And so kind of how we're gonna do this in terms of preserving the, the, um, the conviction. And so we didn't win it. Uh, we, we kind of failed. I mean, it was a good, we did well, but it, it didn't quite get to where we needed to. And so essentially the judge uh, did order a, a new trial or that he could have a new trial, which from a judge's perspective, he had to. When you had those many questions, it had nothing to do but what, what we put in as evidence, because actually we did pretty well. I, but if I I'm the judge, the same him. thing. I have to tease him because I'm defense counsel, as he knows. And so my brother and I have very lively debates. Let's just say that um, he usually takes the prosecutorial side and I usually take the defense side. And so it's, it's for good. Uh, we have fun. I wanted to hand you this real quickly because I want to touch on, you know, we were supposed to do this during Black History yep. Month. And I know you feel very strongly about the history of African-American participation in the U.S. military. So we don't have any questions in the in the chat. So therefore, we're fine. We, we can. I just wanted you to really quickly just give two or three examples. And if you want to look at your list here that you had okay, shared with us. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about that and why you're so passionate about this. So, okay, the reason why I do this, and, and I'm, I'm the chair of the Veteran Affairs and Military Law Section for the National Bar Association. I've been that chair for a long time. Um, I'm involved in several different veterans groups. The one I already told you, I do it because of my personal experience in terms of what I had to go through when I got retired from the military. The second part is the untold story that, and this can be in any discipline, but particularly when you talk about serving this nation. There's so many, there's countless stories of African-Americans and people of color. Their stories are not told in the role that they play in this country, you know, and, and not to get into the debate, but it's interesting when you have these type of things, you know, where the, the debate of CRT and so forth. And the reality is everybody's history needs to be told. Just everybody's history, not one person's history versus another, just everybody's history. And so what I've learned, and I have to admit, I wasn't taught a lot of this stuff, but I've made it my mission to learn about some of these black and brown heroes that just don't make it into the history book, or they're just a small line in the history book. So let me give you some examples for this, all right? Going back to my experience in Iraq, and we didn't get to go into it, um, one of our missions that we had uh, where, for lack of a better word, I was a prison warden for about 500 detainees. And I was sent out there, got stuck out there, and it's a whole nother story. But um, I was there because my job was to determine whether or not we were following the law of war. Were we treating these detainees properly and taking care of them with food, water, shelter, et cetera, and, and not abusing them and so forth. And so I just learned this recently. Um, when you're in a jazz school or, or a JAG, you learn about this thing called the Libra Code. And the Libra Code is kind of the, the, the basic foundation for the law of war in terms of how do you treat prisoners? How do you act on the battlefield and so forth? And it just occurred, uh, Franz Lieber, who Princeton professor, by the way, um, he, he essentially used or, or developed the, the Lieber code. I don't wanna go too far, but a lot of what spurred that was the treatment 
of African-American soldiers during the Civil War. Because what was happening was you had all kinds of things happening. You had situations where if you go to the great crater down in Petersburg in the Petersburg battle, you had Union white commanders killing their own black soldiers. Why? Because the Confederate soldiers were first were killing them, but they were afraid that they were going to get killed because they were commanding these black troops. And so they would turn around and shoot their own, their own men in some instances. Then you have a, a situation, although this predates the incident, but there's a thing called um, the slaughter of Fort Pillow. And essentially there what happens is there's a fort, um, Union and the, the unions were, uh, the Union Army was in this fort, Confederates were approaching, I think I'm saying that right. But long, the basis here is we said we we're gonna surrender, or not we, but the Union said they were gonna surrender. And the Confederate Army, and I know there's some Civil War people out there, maybe you might want to dispute this, but the basis of the story is they ignored that surrender and actually took an opportunity to attack the Union soldiers who were, who were uh, surrendering. And these Union soldiers were a large number were African American. And so they were killed. And so what was unique about that though, that became a rallying cry for a lot of African Americans to join the Union Army. Well, why is this all so important? Well, let's go to we celebrate Juneteenth now. It's a federal holiday now. Well, why did Juneteenth come about? A lot of people just want to say, oh, because we free the slaves. That's not really what's going on here. If you go and read the story, and again, I just learned this after all these years, being a lawyer, going to law school, being a black man all my life. What I find out, one, the Emancipation Proclamation, it wasn't really about freeing the slaves. It was a war, the President's War Powers Act. It's the first time a president said, you know, as a commander in chief, I can do X, Y, and Z to defend my territory or my union or my nation. And so Lincoln did it. Why? Because they recognized, and at Frederick Douglass's uh, request, by the way, in many instances, they recognized they need the manpower from the African-American soldiers. And so that's why you have Juneteenth more than anything else. All right. Well, why is that important? The war turns then. When you start to look at it and you see as African-American soldiers become a part of this war, the war turns. And, if, and we all know the Union wins. But the history, the largest history about that and that role is, isn't really told. Or even more importantly. So, again, yeah, the Libra Code is the foundation for the Geneva Convention and all these other things that weren't how we're supposed to act. Which now they're accusing President Putin or, or Prime Minister Putin, I forget his title right now, of committing was based upon the atrocities committed against African-American soldiers. And then you have heroes like Harriet Tubman. Everybody knows about Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad. She was a Union spy, one of the best to ever do it. Or you have Mary, uh, Mary Elizabeth Bowser. She was a maid in Jefferson Davis's house, the home of the Confederacy. So she saw all the plans that were going on. But because she was a Black woman, they ignored her, didn't think she knew anything. And she was relaying that back to the Union Army. And there's tons of stories like this. Oh, I wish right. we had more time. So I'll, I'm going to give a shout out to Kevin and Paul right now. I'm going to use a presidential privilege and we're going to take an extra five, 10 minutes. OK, thank you, guys. All right. There's so much. More. We might have to have you back just so we can <laughs> talk about this kind of stuff. Um, but I want to move on quickly. You know, one of the big controversies over the last couple of years was about the NFL national anthem controversy, professional athletes. Um, taking a knee or, you know, and, and other things during the anthem. You're a black male in America, but I also know how much, how patriotic you are, quite frankly, and how much you love the flag and you love our country. You've served our country. You've given your life for our country. Um, how did you feel about that? Right, we've talked about it before, but I, I just thought it would be nice to hear your perspective. Well, because of that, we did a program, which you know, and was one of the best or most attended programs, I think, uh, National Bar has seen. But I will tell you my personal opinion. As a service member, as a son of a lieutenant colonel, myself, honestly, I don't think I can do it, all right? But because it's just, it's ingrained in me. I'm gonna salute, I'm gonna have my hand on my heart. That's just what's in me, all right? But with that said, the whole reason why I went to Iraq, the whole reason why Chris went to Iraq and all these others, in my opinion, is so that you had a choice as an American citizen to make that determination. You do what's best for you. You know, and, it, and it's interesting with some of the debates we have on the social scene now about individual rights, you should be able to do what you want to do. Well, I don't understand why that didn't apply 
when some people want to kneel, not to disrespect the flag, because I will tell you, on this panel that Sheila and I did, we had the people who were involved in that process, and we heard it directly from them, what went into it. The reason why Colin Kaepernick kneeled was because a Green Beret told him this is a way, one of the reasons I should say, this is a way to show respect without being disrespectful, because he didn't want to be disrespectful. All right, now you can, we can debate that, whether it's even right, but that's how it really happened. It was never intended to be disrespectful. So regardless of how you feel about it, like I said, I'm gonna be up standing and saluting the flag to the day I die. But if you wanna do that and you're not being dis disrespectful to the flag, to me, that's why I fought for you, for him and all of us. Thanks. I agree, yeah. Um, another, another hot item recently has been, um, and, and it, perhaps it dovetails a little bit of what, what you're saying now with freedom of expression, obviously, um, military members, uh, are, are, are some, they give up certain rights of free speech that, that ordinary civilians are guaranteed under the First Amendment. Um, I, we don't need to get into all the military regulations, what soldiers can and can't do right. um, in uniform, but I think, I think there's a question there, especially where we see um, active duty soldiers participating in the January 6th riots. Um, I'm aware of at least one um, um, officer who was reprimanded for participating in a, in a Black Lives Matter um, protest. And I, I think it begs almost a policy question about whether, you know, it, what, what, is, what should people in uniform be doing when it comes to political speech? That's a tough one. And, you know, yes, you always have a First Amendment right, but as, as Chris uh, mentioned, when you're in uniform, it's amended a little bit, all right? There's certain things you can and can't do, and we're all trained on that, at least you should be. And so my first answer to your question would be, you need to be cautious and need to be aware. You know, at least in years past, the military has a high, high regard in, in, in society. And so a lot of people do look at the things that we do. And so, you know, it's hard to develop a particular policy, I guess, but as a service member, whether you're retired or active duty, you need to know that people are watching what you do just by the virtue that you wear a uniform and put you in a certain standard. And so if you're going to do anything that disgraces the country, disgraces your service, or even question it, maybe it doesn't disgrace it, but even questions it, my advice would be is don't do it. Stay away from it. Um, but that's also it doesn't mean you have to be quiet and don't stand up about things that are wrong. And, and in terms of policy, you know, uh, I'm not a policy to maker. And, uh, but what I would say is, you have to look at each case and, you know, clearly I think it's out of the question. If you're in uniform, you shouldn't be doing any type of protesting or, or anything of that nature. I think that's pretty clear. But if you're on your own time or even more so if you're tired, uh, you have to look at that event and what type of event it was. And I don't mean, is it BLM or is it Proud Boys or that? You have a right to be at whatever in most instances. But if it is related to some type of hate or it turns out there is some violence and you were involved in that violence. I mean, it is possible you could be at that event and things got in hand and you had nothing to do with it. So you have to look at those facts. And if you weren't involved in edging, you know, urging that to happen or doing it, I would say then, you know, you were just exercising your, your First Amendment rights. But if there's any proof that you were knocking down a window at the Capitol or anything like that, then you need to be held accountable. We know better than that, you know, and we have respect. I don't care who the president is. We have a commander in chief and we need to respect that. And there's a way to voice our differences. And most of us, again, are trained to do that. And so I would just encourage my brothers and sisters in arms out there, just remember what we were taught and remember people are always watching us. And we have to hold the standard, whether you agree with what's going on in the politics or not. There's a reason why we are supposed to be separate from politics while we're wearing that uniform. And you need to keep some of that mentality going forward, uh, even in your civilian life. That's just my personal opinion. Really quickly, because we're running out of time, um, the Ukraine. I mean, I, I just feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't at least ask you if you have any thoughts or observations about what's going on in the Ukraine. I have a lot of thoughts, particularly because, I, you know, I dealt with these issues, like I said. I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't talk about it too much, but I, I think it's fair to say I probably do have blood on, blood on my hands because in that staff meeting, for example, the picture you saw, the way it would happen is all the different specialties on the staff would say, you know, we're doing a certain mission. Maybe we're going to target a building, right? We're going to blow something up or we're going to raid it. And they go around the table with all the specialties and what, you know, what the information says. And at some point, and it seemed to be usually at the end, 
General Milley would say, Jack, what's your recommendation? And that's where I have to kind of go through my head with legal, what's not legal, what we can do, what the consequences are going to be, we do it, yada, yada, yada. And a lot of times while I was not the decision maker, I would tell you my advice carried a lot of weight in terms of whether we would go on a particular mission or attack a certain thing or not. And so I think about these things as I'm looking at Ukraine from the other side, like, you know, I know it's a different animal, but, you know, why aren't his advisors telling him, you can't do that because this is what's going to happen if you do, or you are breaking the law here, you know, but what I would say about the Ukraine is, and again, I'm a policy maker and there's people who are studying this and have more intel and so forth. The first thing I would say is, I think fighting for democracy is worth it, no matter where it is. That's just my personal philosophy. If they were to ask me to go, I wouldn't have a problem going. But I also will say this, democracy should be throughout the globe and not looked at certain areas. And so we should make sure we're defending democracy in Ukraine, just as much as we're defending it in Haiti or in the Congo, or even more importantly, here in our own country. So fight, fight to your hardest, but let's do it for everybody. And I understand the strategic part of that. And so I'm not trying to jump in on that. There's reasons why certain things happen. But if we're going to be the leader of this nation, we got to be the example in all parts of the world, not just certain ones or not just the ones that hit the TV. And so I pray for the people of Ukraine because I, guys, I just want you guys to understand to be, you know, I showed some combat pictures, but I think about them. You know, we've had these debates about mask or no mask and how it's affecting kids and so forth, right? But we were forgetting, regardless of what side you're on, and I'm not trying to pick sides here or get into that debate. We're so privileged as Americans that we can even have that debate because you're talking about you're upset because kids couldn't go to school for a few months or for or had to wear a mask. What the kids in Iraq? How long were we in Iraq? I can't remember, Chris. How many years? School wow. systems were shut down for years. Afghanistan, we were there for 20 years. Think about the impact that was happening to those kids. All right. So when we think about these things, when we have our own internal debates, we, we got to remember we can't come from this privileged position. And we have to understand what the rest of the world is really dealing with. Like. We could be Ukraine any day. Can you imagine we're sitting here at the New York City bar and that building right there blows up? That's what's happening in their country right now. But we take it for granted. And there's people dying. So I just want to encourage any policymaker, any soldier, if you want to stand for democracy, stand up for democracy. And for me, and I can only speak for me, if that means I lose my life, then I lose my life. But I know I died for the right thing. Um, both you and your sister are very heavily involved in bar associations. And it seems like pro bono, uh, especially with you with veterans issues, is important. Can you speak um, to the importance of, of keeping that as part of your your, 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 your practice, part of your, your career as well. Yeah. Um, you know, my day job, I'm not, I don't do anything with veterans. Um, but for the reason I kind of expressed earlier, it, it's, it's something that's in me, you know, our parents taught us to serve. And so that's, that's ingrained in us. And so my way to do it is kind of what I know, what I've experienced and what I can bring to the table. And so I, you know, MBA, National Bar Association, I do the same thing with the ABA. Um, and then I'm in, you know, Military Officers Association of America and all these things. So, by the way, shout out because he got a special honor. Come on, share it. I can't remember what exactly change maker or what was it called? Yeah, I, I was fortunate and blessed enough to uh, be labeled one of the 2022, I guess, change makers. Um, of the military, what's it called? The association? Of the, yeah, the ML, of MOA, MOA. And so, another great organization that, that is kind of like a, a lobbyist or an advocate arm. Um, you I'm know, a doting for, proud sister. I admit it. Okay, he's, and, and, he's humble, and I just want people to know. And to be clear, I don't get into the lobbying world. I can't. All right, so I don't do that. But my focus is to do whatever I can to help the service member and their families. And so we've created scholarships in the MBA to help law students who are going to do things to help the family. However, we can, we we do, and that's what I want to do because people help me. But more importantly, I have had a. I hesitate to say unique, but I've had some experiences that have opened my eyes to a lot of things. And particularly when it comes to medical care and so forth, I remember going through the retirement process, the medical retirement process, thinking to myself, here I am as a lawyer in the JAG or 
And I'm having a tough time understanding what X, Y, and Z means on this, on this paperwork. It's literally gonna set my future for my family, for myself. I just couldn't imagine what that 17 year old who got hurt is going through and how they're understanding the paperwork on that. And so one, I just say, we do a great job. The VA does a great job, but we can do better. All of us can do better. And, and one of my favorite things is a lot of people like to say, thank you for your service. Sheila said it earlier today, but I just wanna say something. And I, and I have this conversation with my buddies lots of times. That's great. And we appreciate it. But one, lots of times, it's kind of cliche, people say it. If you really want to say thank you for your service, do something for a service member's service. Help them out. Whether a lot of, a lot of veterans are homeless. I think they account for 8% of the, the criminal justice system. And why? Because a lot of them are related to PTSD and drug habits and so forth. That's where you all can make a difference. So if you really want to say thank you for your service, get involved in one of those type of activities. There's plenty of work to do there. Because in my mind, and maybe I'm biased because I am a service member, besides teachers, there's nobody else in this nation we owe more than our service members. And I don't care whether you're ultra conservative, ultra liberal. Again, who are the people of Ukraine looking towards right now? Their army. Who's giving them inspiration to fight? Their army, their service members. It all comes back to that. The examples of the Black History, black history uh, service members have talked about. It's the things that they did with others. They, they didn't do it alone. That has allowed us to live the life that we live. Don't forget that. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how powerful you are. It could be all gone tomorrow if that bomb drops outside our door today. I think, Chris, is that a good note to end on? I think so. My goodness. Well, I just want to thank baby brother. I'm so proud of him. And that's why I just, I really wanted you to be here today. I thank you so much. Chris, I thank you. Thank you. It was so wonderful being with you. Thanks to the Military and Veteran Affairs Committee of the City Bar. And we thank you for sharing our story with us as well. We were co-sponsored, by the way, by the National Bar Association's, give me the right name, Veteran Affairs and Military Law Section. That's right. And my Shout brother's out. actually the on chair there. of Hope that. you guys are watching. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to all of you. So I, I'm serious about this. God bless America and God bless all of you. Okay. Thank you for- oh. Let me say one thing. Sure. First of all, Chris, thank you. Thank you to New York City Bar. Uh, but to Sheila in particular, I don't know if I have this opportunity. Uh, I'm so proud of you. You're a history maker, my hero. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know what you've gone through these last two years and all the issues that you've had to deal with in your particular presidency, and you've been phenomenal. I've read your things and I give credit to the bar itself. You guys are a phenomenal group. I I've, I've keep abreast of what you're doing. And so I salute you all and I thank you and I wish you the best and I'm just so proud of you. Okay, he's got me teared up. It's time to go. Thank you all so much. I love you, Bar of Hope. Take care.